you were a mascot, dude. That's <laughs> I was yeah, I need to hear more about this. You were a mascot. <laughs> when, a mascot. where, why, for what team? Yeah. We know Brian, all we these aired it on Fox. The like, aliens told us. The aliens told us. Yeah. <laughs> you were oh. eagle. You said it in an interview. Okay. I just saw okay. this. <laughs> Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome into a brand new edition of Mics Are Hot. I'm Caitlin Vinci alongside my girl, Heather DeBeau. How's it going, my friend? It is going good. Top of the morning to you. Top Bright and early we, over here on the West Coast. <laughs> you've been up since 4.30. People may not realize that because we were yes. texting you about this show and I couldn't believe when you responded. <laughs> it was well, of, like 4.52 yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, first of all, I wasn't up at 4 30 but i have this bad habit of watching like netflix or apple tv on my phone so i had fallen asleep watching gosh what was i even watching last night aliens the, no no aliens but i think i was watching uh, the morning show or something i don't know but anyways okay. passed That's out fair. fell asleep so then this morning uh, when you sent the text in the group message it was like oh gosh what time is it oh it's 4 30 Okay. Oh, I Hi. Forget that. That I need to like budget in my mind that you're hours and hours behind us. That's I was okay. watching Aliens, by the way. Oh, you were this morning. Yeah, you, you got to watch Aliens. You got to explain. What do you mean you're watching Aliens? <laughs> they were outside my window. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> Saying hello. No, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Who knows though? Uh, no, it's a documentary show on Netflix uh, called Encounters. It's oh. really, really interesting. Aliens are really having a moment. I mean, my son's dressing up as ET for Halloween. Oh, he's so I, cute. I, I, <laughs> I remember seeing the video. He so, was so cute. I can't see yes. it. Anyway, yeah. I'm very excited for Halloween this year. The whole family is getting into the spirit of, of E.T. Yeah? So did you teach him how to do the E.T. phone oh, no. He does say it. Like, he it, does. His vocabulary is getting so much better. Also, my husband can do a great E.T. voice, which I did not know this up until a week ago. Yeah. I was cracking up because he it sounded just like it does in the movies. That's awesome. I was like, have you been practicing that? I suggested he does it on the radio to Alex, just like a random yes. voice during the race. Yes. <laughs> and then we can play it back on here. <laughs> that would exactly. be great. Can you imagine? He'd probably be like, what? Who was that? <laughs> who was, who was <laughs> that? Is that ET? Are, are the aliens invading <laughs> us right now no? during this race? <laughs> race? Oh, that's how it would all go down, right? <laughs> do, you, do you, I mean, you're watching that documentary, but do you believe in aliens? Do you think it's I real? I do. You I do? Because to me, there's just no way we're the only life form out there. Okay. And the, if you. you watch this documentary, you're going to see there's so many situations that have happened all over the entire world really okay. bizarre strange things yeah so yes, i don't know it kind of freaks me out i don't believer. think i can it watch it freaky. because i have bad dreams as it is and so if i watch something like that i'm gonna dream about it and i don't want to i don't want to <laughs> that's fair that's fair um yeah. well speaking of not aliens uh we don't have an alien joining the show today but we do have or a is big he? or is he <laughs> or is he well, I don't he know. might be one <laughs> He's into, you know, Star Wars and Where's, stuff. So, like, he true, probably connects true. with them on a different level that we cannot comprehend, you know? We can Obi -Wan, ask Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. We'll Obi -Wan. ask him about Obi-Wan. Uh, we are going to ask him a Star Wars question. Uh, but this theme of this episode today is racing families. Of course, we know there's been so many families uh, throughout the years involved in the sport. The Blaney's being one of them. And our most recent race winner, of course, out at Talladega, Ryan Blaney. He's going to be with us on the show. I'm really, really excited uh, to have him on. He has such a funny personality. I know this is going to be entertaining because we're yes. not asking him the run of the mill questions like how fast was your car? We're, no. we're going no, off we're the not. grid. We're, we're doing all kinds of different things. Yes. And we are predicting the future because we had already had him booked to be on the show prior. <laughs> and you and I were texting like, what if Blaney won? And I just put it out there. He's going to win so we can have him on the show and we look cool. Like we got the winner of Talladega. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. Boom. Yes. Mic no, drop. Mics are hot. Mic drop. <laughs> hot and dropped. Yeah, yeah. we did um, the book him weeks ago. So this is really, really cool that he ended up getting the win at Talladega. What a win it was, by the way. You and I were trading some videos back and forth from uh social media showing all the close finishes for him yes, yes. at talladega like, 3 2019 yeah, 2020 finish. and this year yeah this photo funny, finishes right? like by like less than a second right i mean it's just crazy how how that happens i mean i think we should come up with some kind of 
I don't know, nickname for him, like the king of the photo finish or Mr. Photo Finish. Mr. <laughs> photo Finish. I like that. Or Mr. Talladega, since he likes to win there a lot. I don't know. I Super know. Speedway guy. We'll come Super up with something. Super Speedway guy. Super Speedway what? guy. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Yeah. Hey, uh, Super hey yeah, Super Speedway guy. <laughs> what, but what a cool place to win at. And I want to yes. ask him about that because I feel like Talladega is one of those racetracks that they all want to win at yes. just because of the environment. The atmosphere is amazing. The Talladega Boulevard is incredible. Yes. And yes. it's not a crown jewel, but it probably should be in its yeah. own way. I feel like a lot of people think of it as, you know, not a know. crown jewel, but it's one of those places that you definitely want to win, either Daytona mm -hmm. or there, right? But um, he did mention after he won, he said, we're going to have fun tonight, so I can't wait to ask him what I they know. did to celebrate, because even though the race is over, all those campers out there in the infield in Talladega, they're still going hard, and they like to party. Oh, yes. If you've never been to Talladega, I would highly recommend that you go. It's like Mardi Gras times a thousand. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I wonder if they contributed to those items that were left behind you know how they do I those pictures that it's the yes. best it's, it's the best so funny people leave um, behind couches and all kinds of random stuff, grills that are broken and, you know just and just, then weird stuff like leftover cooler with like eggs and bacon just chilling i don't know <laughs> <laughs> eggs and bacon what's yeah. the weird craziest thing you've seen on talladega boulevard I'm not sure I'm allowed to say, say it, to be honest with you. I can't say um, mine either. <laughs> I know. This is a, are we PG-13? What are we rated? We're definitely not that, oh, like, gosh. R or more, right? <laughs> yeah, I would like to say it, but I'm just going to say this. Go experience it for yourself, and yes. you'll see what we mean. Yes. I there's think, some I very think... interesting competitions that yes. take place Yes, there. there's some competitions. But there's always really good, like, costumes if you will or what people yeah. wear and dress up as that are just very random and like but just fun just makes you laugh when you see everybody's just having a good time that's what you're there to do have fun exactly and just party hardy <laughs> it's an uh, speaking of hardy he performed i know like hardy wow transition <laughs> too you just weave that tapestry very well um yes yeah so talladega is a great weekend uh of course, it was a great weekend for, for Ryan Blaney. Um, and then not so great, though, when we look at the Craftsman Truck Series in certain ways. Woof. A lot yes. happened that race. A lot a happened, lot happened, happened that in that race. Brett Moffitt, um, of course, won, which yes. he hadn't been in a truck all season long. But he was a champion in the Truck Series, in case people have forgotten, back in 2018. But what everybody's kind of talking about this week would be the situation between Matt Crafton and the rookie Nick Sanchez. And it was coming towards the end of the race, I think like lap 92 and Sanchez gave Crafton a really big push. Crafton came down the track and it collected like 14 different teams. Yeah. So the big one that we always yep. talk about happened at the end, yep, but it wasn't happen. that big one was not the biggest one we would have <laughs> because no. then a big fight ensued in the garage area. What did you think when you saw this happen? Well, we didn't get to see it. No. Until yeah. It's it hard when you're not social media. Right. It's hard when you're not actually at the track. I mean, we, mm -hmm. like, I feel so removed. So I actually didn't even, I wasn't even made aware of this until the next day because I was working a race in uh, Salem for ARCA. So I didn't even see any of this till the next day. And in fact, uh, Bob Pockris actually texted me <laughs> like, course. Hey, just FYI, here's what happened to Sanchez. Like he might have a broken nose. I'm like, wait, what, what are you even talking mm -hmm. about? Why am I getting this update? But, um, I don't know. After watching the video, it's still, it's just hard to tell exactly what went down. Um, I don't it know. I, I have like mixed feelings about it because there's a part of me that likes fights. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it. I don't know about this fight though, because you don't see what all transpired. Right. Like, I would have seen see, exactly like, how it all went down and there's mixed, there's, you know, three stories happening, right? There's Nick stories, Matt's story, and then the truth. So we don't really know exactly what happened, uh, but it didn't look good. It's pretty ugly. Yeah. Oh, look at oh. you. Matt's story, Nick's story, and the truth. It sounds like yeah. a... <laughs> Well, that's usually how it here. works. That's usually how it works. <laughs> truth is somewhere in the middle. But yes. The truth now is that they've both been fined. So yep. Matt Crafton has a $25,000 fine. Sanchez with a $5,000 fine. Uh, no suspensions. But I did hear Elton Sawyer talking about this, who, of course, is a senior VP of competition with NASCAR saying that he felt like Crafton, uh, it was a little bit not premeditated, wasn't the words he used, but that Crafton had some time to think about what he wanted to do. It wasn't sure. like a heat of the moment, just got out of the race vehicles come together. So right. I think that's why his uh, fine was a little steeper. And then he said for Nick Sanchez, it was because of the things he was saying, which we all know, we're not repeating it here, <laughs> um, that his comments are, are yeah. why he ended up 
uh, getting a yeah. fine as well. I mean, well, it's but... tough. Like, I don't know how I would react if, if I just got punched in the nose. I'd probably say some choice words as well. So, I mean, <laughs> in, in, I mean, he was reacting in the moment instead of yes. premeditating what he was going to say. So, I don't know. Right. Whatever. It, it's, ugh, I don't know. It's <laughs> I'm not really sure what to say about it, honestly. <laughs> and then Matt Crafton, of course, put out his statement and um, kind of shared his view. And Nick Sanchez put out a statement as well as a result of the fines. So, it'll be interesting to see what transpires in the future between these two drivers and teams because they are obviously in the midst of the playoffs. Crafton's been eliminated but Sanchez sure. still in the hunt. So we've got a couple weeks off, though, from the truck series because they're yes. racing in Miami in, in a few weeks, which is kind of unusual that we have this little bit of a break here. Yeah, I think when situations like that happen, too, though, it's a big learning experience, right? Like, mm -hmm. you're either going to learn something from it, and then you're going to approach right. the next race a certain way. You're either going to want that payback or you're not. You're going to get over it or you're not. And right. I think sometimes uh, seeing how guys and gals handle that type of situation uh, speaks – like volumes on who they are. So it'll be interesting just to see how they move forward or if they don't, yeah. I don't know, but I think eh, we'll see. It'll be We're interesting. Find out. Yeah, it will. <laughs> Matt Crafton's the Russell Crowe of the Craftsman truck series. I've always said that. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. look the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's, yeah, he does. Yeah. You're right. I, I guess I've never really thought about that. I was watching Gladiator last night and I was literally, cause it was on Netflix. I, I guess all yeah. I do is watch Netflix. It sounds yeah, like I have no life all I do outside either. of Netflix. <laughs> But anyway, that film is on there, which is one of my favorite films of all time. And as I'm watching, I'm like, he literally looks like, like Matt Crafton. Like, yeah, could be his no, you're time. right. You're absolutely mm. right. That's good. Everybody that's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's mm -hmm. true. Have Same you ever thing. seen where they like have people that find their twin like randomly, like not their real no. twin, but they've brought together people from all over the world that just look like each other. Like, I think, I don't know what <laughs> magazine... <laughs> I don't know what magazine this was, but I swear I saw it where I like not they just that. found random strangers that could be twins. Yours is right. Hillary Swank. I told is you. Is it that really? Well, she's one of them. You said you've gotten a few people. I've gotten a few people. So the one I'm most proud of, and I'm not saying that I believe this, but like I want to believe it, is Jennifer Aniston. I've gotten I mean, that a few heck, times, yeah, and I'm like, hey. That's hey, I mean, up? she's a timeless <laughs> classic beauty. But yeah. Hilary Swank, I saw her in a movie recently and I thought of you. Yeah. The other one I got was, um, I can't remember the actress's name, but the mom from Terminator. <laughs> oh, shoot. I don't even know if I know who that is. You'll have to go watch it back. Because she has, because I think it's because my jaw, I have like a distinct Defined jaw line. Jaw. Yeah. There mm -hmm. you go. So I've gotten we'll Kristen see. Bell before okay the actress yep i yep. guess i see, I see that i guess yeah. uh, other than that i haven't really gotten anybody i guess i look like no one which is no whatever. you look like somebody you look like somebody. <laughs> who would you like if you could play like an actress or be an actress in your in your life who would you be would oh you margot one? robbie oh That's heck yeah you look like gosh. her I, you look like her Perfect. i wish but <laughs> she's definitely my favorite we're gonna ask blaney about that Actually, yes. if, if an actor portrays him, who he would choose. Speaking of Ryan Blaney, I'm going to make this try and make this turn back to what our show's <laughs> about today is the racing families, which I personally think this is so interesting because our producer, Krista Leader, helped put together kind of a list of all of the different family names that have been in the sport. There really is so many of There's them. There's a lot. There's a lot. And it, it sort of paints a bigger picture of, you know, once – Say your father's a racer, right? And you grow up going to the track, which is how Ryan was, how Chase Elliott was, um, how Dale Jr. was. It's just kind of part of your life then at that point. Like, that's all you know. Those are the only people you're around. Those, those are the places you're going every weekend. And I think it's just kind of a natural progression for you to get into the sport as well. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And like, just to start naming some of these names, I mean, we've got What's the Bush name? brothers, Bodine really? brothers, Labani brothers, the Wallace family. Wood Brothers, <laughs> Waltrip, Allison, Petty. Petty. I mean, gosh, Petty. And then the France family just, I mean, mm -hmm. they might not have been drivers necessarily, but they drove this sport, right? I mean, right. they're huge names. So it's really interesting. And I know we're missing a lot of names. Like we're not trying to hit everybody right now, right, but right. there's so many some. to touch mm -hmm. on. Um, and it's so interesting because I've always, one thing about like, like you said, following in the footsteps. I always think it's interesting for the son or daughter to follow in the footsteps of like the famous name. And the one that always stands out to me, obviously is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Following in the mm -hmm. footsteps of Earnhardt, because I just feel like there was a lot of pressure to live up to that name. Right. And right. then also 
just expectations. I feel like fans mm-hmm. and people watching the sport, they expect you to be as good as your dad. Or even Kyle Petty probably felt that, you know, with his dad, Richard oh, Petty. Or even Jay Richard, Elliot. I don't know if he felt yeah. that way with Lee. You know, like there's just so many guys and that have to kind of follow what had already happened. And then it's almost like if you don't do as well or if you're not as great, then all of a sudden you're like, well, you suck. You can't drive. You know what I mean? And it's, it's yeah. just it's unfortunate that that happens sometimes but and then on the flip side how cool is it to say like yeah my dad was Dale Earnhardt senior or you know what I mean like that would be really neat (laughs) it is a unique situation as you're describing and now we're seeing even the next generation coming in because I know for race hub on Fox we've been documenting some of the next generation racers we've had um Carter McMurray story Brexton Bush which is even more interesting how those guys are going to do someday, probably making their way up to the Cup Series. So it, it yeah. really just carries through and through and through. And I and I know, obviously, you're not a racer. I'm not a racer. But you were telling me earlier that you did grow up, though, going to the track and being a part of your dad's racing career. Yep. Um, when I was still living in Denver, I was born in Denver, Colorado. So when I still live there, I have vivid memories of my dad taking me to see NHRA and the drag races. And I just remember like thinking, oh my gosh, this is so loud. And then when we lived here in Phoenix, (laughs) I know like what? Uh, When we moved to Phoenix, uh, we went out to the track there and we used to sit on Rattlesnake Hill. So at that time, I mean, it's first come first serve. So you have to get up really early in the morning, get out there, get in line and then drag out your ice chest and your easy up and everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I remember being there and this was back when Earnhardt was still racing and they still had that Goodyear walkover bridge over I guess what would have been turns three and four then um yeah but I remember falling asleep at the track because it was just like you know you get bored and you're tired you're just like ugh, we've been here all day um but then you mentioned my dad he raced when I was in high school he started racing when he was young but then he got back into it and originally the plan was to have me and my sister race so he started in dwarf cars and we were supposed to eventually race but we just had too much going on we had you know sports dance friends and it was just like I don't want to go but I spent a lot, a lot of time with my dad in the garage, helping him set up the car. And then when we went to the track, I was in charge of like tires. I was a tire specialist. So I did there you go. tire pressure. I fueled the car, <laughs> tear offs, scrape the mud. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun because we used to race at Manzanita Speedway, which is this very famous uh, dirt track. It's no longer there, unfortunately, but some of my favorite memories are from out there. And now it's interesting to see. I remember actually when I was there, this is really good. The announcer at the time, his name was Wendy. And so he would say like JJ Yaley, like I remember J. hearing J. that J. name Yaley. or Casey Kane yeah. or uh, oh, yeah. you know Tony Absolutely. Stewart. They would be racing sprint cars sometimes there when we were racing just our you know local Friday or Saturday night yeah. show. Um, so that was really cool to always be a part of, and then to now be like man, um, like Ricky Thornton Jr. He grew up, you know, we were friends of the family, and now look at him now, he's breaking records all over the place in the dirt late model world. So it's neat to see people and he comes from a racing family. So his dad raced when my dad was racing. So they race each other. Um, And then he has two brothers who also race and his mom used to race too. And I I hear she was actually the best out of all of them. And I think she'll even tell you that. Yeah. So (laughs) there's racing families all over the country and it's really neat. And, and I don't think that I don't want to say this because I don't mean it in a bad way, but I feel like racing, I think of family because everybody's a family, even if you're not, you know, directly Absolutely. related. We have our NASCAR family. Like you're my family. Like you know what I'm saying? Like there's just this family feel to our sport and I love it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I- I couldn't agree more because these are the people you travel with every weekend. It's the main people you're around. Um, It definitely has the whole family unit feel. When something bad happens to someone in the the industry, everyone kind of chips in and is supportive and there for that person. And I think that's what makes it such a unique dynamic for sure sure. is is Mm -hmm. working in this industry. Um, Okay. So every week we ask for fan questions from you guys. We have some good ones. A former guest and friend of the podcast sent in a question, Jeff Cordero, who we love. What track would you like to see come back to the schedule? I wrote down two. I wrote down Rockingham because there have been a few rumors, you know, matriculating about it, maybe coming back at some point in time. I feel like that was such a neat venue and like a lot of iconic races and things happen there would be good. And Road America, which is a okay. sour, like a sore subject in a way, because this is a recent departure from mm-hmm. uh, NASCAR. I loved going to Road America. I really liked the area as well. And I thought the fans were just awesome uh, up there. So I would yes. love to see that track can come back at some point. I like it. I'm going to go with 
I don't know if this will ever happen, but I was thinking about all the tracks in the North Carolina area. And how yeah. about Bowman Gray, the Madhouse? Oh, yeah, the Madhouse. Yeah. <laughs> the Madhouse. That, like, so that cool. would be so awesome. cool. Now, granted, that's a very small facility. So it would be kind yeah. of like they'd have to have like a wait list and like yeah. VIP treatment to get on the list to be there. Kind of like the <laughs> F1 race that's going to happen in Vegas. Vegas. Apparently, it's like yeah. you got to pay like three grand just for tickets you're where probably yeah, can only see like away. 10 feet of the track i know <laughs> so yeah but i think bowman gray would be really cool but you know like hickory south boston like those type yes. of tracks i think would be neat to go back to for sure absolutely all right you got the next question what do you got? all right so we have meg who wants to know who are your champion picks mm. so we're gonna do for all three series i know that we still have rounds left for them to make it through but um i've had a feeling about the truck series since about Martinsville on who I'm going to go with for the champion. And it might be the low hanging fruit, but I've had this feeling way before, but Corey Heim is my pick for trucks. Same. And then, <laughs> same. <laughs> okay. We're on the same page. Um, for Xfinity, I think this would just be for me, like a really good feel good story. I would love to see Justin Allgaier win the championship. Yeah. I think he can Little do Gator. it. Little Gator. Yeah. Little Gator. Little Gator champion 2023. And then another low-hanging fruit for Cup, but I just have to do it because he's been killing the game, and that's Willie B. He's Love my it. champion for Cup Series. Cool. Mine is Austin Hill, I think would be a great story as well. He's been super impressive this season over there at RCR and Xfinity, so he's my Xfinity pick. For Cup, I picked Martin Truex Jr., um, I like and I know it. it's been a rough go lately, but I, I picked him just because, obviously, a past champion. He knows what it takes to get it done. He rises to the occasion in those high-pressure moments, so does his team. So I'm going Truex for I my like Cup that. Series champion. All it's right, hard next. to pick. I'm just going to say that. It's hard to pick. <laughs> it is hard to pick. I, I also want to preface this. I'm happy for anyone who wins. Uh, yes, Because absolutely. I know how Same. much they put into yes. it. So They all deserve it. They all deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question from Ethan Hall says, any favorite drivers uh, you had before getting involved in NASCAR? Oh, uh, well, I my favorite driver is Jimmy Johnson. And he, and he always will be. <laughs> Jimmy! <laughs> Jimmy. And the reason is, I, it's just so hard to not root for that man. Because for those of us who know him and have had the chance to interview him and talk to him outside of, you know, work and things like that, he is just such a great human, genuine, yes. authentic, good guy, always treats the media with respect, whether he had a good finish, bad finish, somewhere in between. I feel privileged that I was able to witness him and his talents of one of the greatest all time athletes in history. Yes. yes. And it's so cool to even know that you got to cover a period of his career because Absolutely. the person he was off track matched the talent on track. Yes. And he's the first person I ever interviewed on camera, by the way. So really? Mine was talk about of... intimidating, but also like he was great, though, because just real quick story. He came up to me after the interview and he said, hey, great job. I had no idea you'd never done that before. And I was like, oh, OK, 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 <laughs> like, you know, I was like more nervous in that moment that he was talking yes. to me after. I'm like, what? Right. Who are you? And at the time, I think he was only a three time champion. But still, I mean, ha, been only, three by, three like, times. only three times, Jeez. but, wow. you know, whatever. <laughs> But yeah, so That's awesome. I like that. Um, but I'll just real quickly say that uh, Earnhardt Sr. was my favorite. And then I was low-key in love with Dale Jr. Like, not going to lie. But anyway, <laughs> that was my, those are my favorites before getting, in, before getting into the, oh, into the sport. So, there you go. Yeah. All right. There you go. Next question. All right. So this, this comes from our good buddy, Rich. He's a truck series official. And he wants to know, you're packing your bag for race weekend. What are the three must-haves while on the road? All right. Mine are... I have to have a sweatshirt or hoodie of some sort because it gets cold AF on those planes sometimes. Mm -hmm. So no matter if it's summer, winter, fall, whatever, I always have a sweatshirt with me. I also have uh, multiple phone chargers because I always leave I one. I leave one in the rental car the whole weekend so I don't have to chug it back and forth to the track with me or like where to go, what is it doing? So um, two chargers or at least two. And then you have to have extra shoes. Because you never know when Mother Nature is going to ruin your party and your feet That's are going right. to get soaked. So I always have extra shoes and then maybe an extra outfit just in case if there's a rain delay. So you don't have to go to like Walmart or Target and buy stuff while you're right. in, yeah. in, uh, uh, in, on site. But we always have like our rain gear like in the truck. But you just yeah. never know when there's going to be a torrential downpour. And the next thing you know, your feet are just soaked. And then you have to use a blow dryer to try to dry your shoes out. <laughs> yeah. Never an ideal situation. No, never. Um, um, 
I was trying to think of stuff that like I have forgotten in the past that was such a pain. I always need eye drops because I wear contacts and like mm -hmm. it's just the elements at the track. There's fumes, there's dirt, like stuff flying around. I always need some eye drops. Phone charger also because like as soon as you land, you plug it into your car. It's a whole thing. Like you need the yep. phone charger and your hard yep. card. It, that yes. gives me anxiety. The thought of leaving the hard card at home never has happened to me. Knock on wood, but that's the way we get in and out of the whole racetrack. And if yes. you, for some reason, forgot it, like I could picture it being a pain to try and get yeah. it. So those... I triple double check that. I have a little bit yeah. of OCD, and that's one yes. thing that I, I will check four times at least before I leave my house that it's in my backpack in the same spot it was two minutes ago from when there I checked go. again. <laughs> yes, got to make sure you have the essentials. So there's our tips for if you're traveling with NASCAR, what yeah, you need to boom. bring. Yes, those are good ones. <laughs> and as promised, Ryan Blaney, the big Talladega winner with us now. Great to see you. We so appreciate you taking some time uh, for us. And it was really awesome to see you get that win out at Talladega because I feel like that is one of those tracks that every driver wants to win at, even though you've done it multiple times. It's always special, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on and uh, happy I can be on. This podcast is fairly new, right? So it's nice to be one of the early guests. On exactly. It. Um, no, yeah, I mean, uh, this past weekend was obviously ideal for us. Um, it's fortunate to just be in the running to try to win the race, let alone, you know, be able to, to win it. And like you said, to be able to win that, uh, that place, you know, three times is like, you know, some guys never get to win there once. So we've been lucky enough to, to be able to do it a few times. So, um, just a good day by everybody was, you know, we really kind of had a plan going into that race and rarely those plans especially those places kind of go your way and and sunday was just one of those days like our plan kind of worked and we found ourselves in a spot to win and and we were able to inch it out so just uh, yeah fun day for sure and uh, makes makes this weekend a little bit less stressful so that's nice <laughs> that must be really nice to go into the roval and just have a Take a deep chill breath, day. just chill yeah. out and enjoy yeah. it. Maybe get another win moving on. Yeah. Um, but you did mention after the race win, and I don't know if this was part of your plan, but Riley Herbst was pushing you and you made a point to say how good of a job he did. And especially as a rookie. Um, so what kind of concerns did you have having him behind you? Were there any at that moment? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, just because he hasn't done it very often in those cars, right? That was really my only concern. I mean, I have the most confidence uh, ever, I mean, in Riley's abilities, but Experience is a big thing too at, at those tracks with that car, like right? they, they draft different than the Xfinity cars. So um, when I saw him choose behind me, I was happy because it was a Ford behind me and I knew Fords we can push pretty well. But at the same time, I was like, man, I, I you know, his lack of experience in these cars at this place, I was a little nervous about, but he did a fantastic job. Um, I mean, he never stepped, you know, the wrong way and, and never stepped out of line in a spot like, like pushing me in a wrong spot, uh, being too soft on me, you know, and not being aggressive, he was perfect. And uh, so, yeah, I, you definitely, in those places, you know, your help behind you means so much that you, I feel like you're obligated to like thank that guy for being committed to you and doing a good job. And, and he did a fantastic job and was a huge reason we were in a spot to win that race. It all worked out for you. And I know you addressed this in the media center afterwards, the burnout thing. Just clear this up once again. If it, anyone didn't hear what you said about the burnouts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of ironic because I did one. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I haven't done burnouts since like 2016. And um, how I started not doing them was I, I think I won an Xfinity race at like Dover or something. And it was... Like the first year NBC started doing the front stretch interviews. Yeah. And in the Xfinity car, I think we needed like the motor. They needed the motor for something. So it's like, all right, don't do a burnout. <laughs> so I just kind of did a little circle and stopped on front stretch and kind of waved and did my thing. And then I think I it was either Sunday because I was running the cup race the next day or the next week. Dale Inman, uh, if people who don't know Dale Inman, very famous crew chief, worked with Richard Petty for a long time and is still around, which is amazing. And he's always been nice to me. And, and Dale likes to get you by the collarbone. So he kind of comes up to me the next week, <laughs> grabs me by the collarbone, kind of whispers in my ear. He's like, hey, I really like how you don't do, didn't do a burnout after that one. And then he told me the whole Kentucky, Kentucky Derby story. He's like, you don't see the winner of the Kentucky Derby <laughs> get off the horse and start beating the shit out of it. And uh, I just thought that was the coolest thing, especially coming from a guy like that, right? And uh, yeah. I liked that a lot. 
And so I was like, all right, well, Dale, for you, I'll never do burnouts after I win just for that reason. And uh, I was super pumped on Sunday. So I did one and uh, I can't wait to see him and be like, man, I, uh, sorry for breaking our rule there, but uh, you know, I was, I was super pumped, but um, yeah, it's a funny, funny story that Dale told me. And um, that's kind of where it came from. And, and people seem to get a, get a pretty good kick out of it. Some, oh, some yeah. people on, on Twitter, like fans, they're like, well, jockeys beat the horses the whole race. I'm like, oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm different, a different thing. Like, <laughs> totally different. I think yeah. he has a fair point on that. So, I mean, good advice taken by you. So yeah. how was the after party? What did you do to celebrate? Or did you have a low-key night or what? Um, well, I mean, as you get older, right, you don't really, you can't go as much anymore. As you get older, older. Um, you're not even that old. Come on. <laughs> I'm 40 this year. I'm 30. Oh, I'm getting old. oh I'm, no. Uh, oh, no. Uh, yeah. Over the hill. <laughs> uh, we got back fairly, not a bad time. I think I walked in the house about 10 and, um, had some buddies over. A couple of my pit guys were here. So that was nice, nice. and just kind of had a relaxed evening and, and, uh, and all that stuff. So, um, no, no like ragers like there used to be, <laughs> uh, but it's, well, I think it's important to, to be able to do that and celebrate in some aspect because these things are hard to come by and you never know yeah. which one's going to be your last one. So um, you always have to appreciate them. And you have, you have quite the uh, playoff beard going right now. And normally Penske makes you guys be a little clean cut, shaved and all that. So if you could, how long would you let your hair and beard grow? Like, would you go like Aquaman, like Jason Momoa? <laughs> like, you know, would you go like long Brad Pitt hair or what? Yes. To yes. Work. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to work. There you go. If I had, I got my hair cut. My hair's short. Uh, but I, yeah, I started doing this playoff beard, I think, ever since I could grow one. And um, <laughs> I usually grow them pretty quick. Uh, I start right after Daytona and, and, uh, it comes in fairly rapidly, but, uh, yeah, I, I have to balance it out. Like if I'm going to do the playoff beard, I have to have shorter hair. I think that's kind of, you know, that kind of balances it out. But if I had my way, yeah, I mean, I would have a Santa Claus beard and long hair. Santa and, Claus uh, beard. So hopefully when I retire and I, if I still have hair, I can grow <laughs> it pretty good. I know the beard will get, get fine, but if I still have hair as my, if my hairline hasn't receded, enough when i retire i'll uh i'll definitely start growing it out so we're gonna hope for the best for you the receding yeah. hairline seems to be a trend unfortunately oh, for, yeah. for race car drivers we wear uh, hats and helmets you know i mean that's true just, right yeah. right so. we get it hey but um, at least there's hair club so no worries on that i feel yeah. like by the time i retire and i'm gonna be in trouble i feel like technology is gonna be just through the roof with hair stuff you know who I mean, knows where they'll be at yeah at that it point wasn't that long time. ago they were stapling ant legs to your head and and having hair plugs so <laughs> Well, you there, you, there you go. We're going to hope for the best on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I mentioned earlier in the show, today's theme is about racing families. For the record, I don't know if you saw the shirt I'm wearing. Do you see this? It's for your dad. Oh, nice. I found this on Etsy and I like, I had to immediately buy it because I knew we were doing this show. And so I figured I would rep him for this because nice. we want to talk a little bit about this growing up in a racing family. What was your earliest memory of being at the racetrack? Do you recall? I, um... I'd say I have glimpses of uh, my dad won the Knoxville Nationals in 1997. And I have like tiny moments that I remember of that. I was like four. Um, so I remember spots of that. Um, I'd say more vividly, I remember more of his kind of NASCAR career, you know, early 2000s, that type of stuff, being in the bus lot with a bunch of other drivers, kids, um, making, you know, friends and, and stuff like that, that I know to this very day. Yeah. Um, I'd say I remember that even more, uh, but yeah, I'd say the earliest little tiny pieces I've put together is that Knoxville nationals in 97. Do you feel like you had a clear idea of what he did exactly when you were that young? Like, like how cool he was at that time? <laughs> um, I, I don't, I think I didn't like, it didn't, it doesn't click to you that like you understand what your parents do exactly until I was probably, I mean, I was probably 11 or 12 by the time I like really realized like the ins and outs of everything, you know, okay. until I, and I was even racing at nine, you know, so I was like running go-karts and quarter midgets, but I didn't really fully understand like the massive reach of NASCAR kind of everything that goes into it. I just thought, Oh, it's just, you know, it was just what dad did. Right. And then as you get older, you kind of understand a little bit more and you, you grasp it as you, 
as your brain grows and you get knowledge of, you know, <laughs> how you, how you put into perspective of how things are. Uh, so yeah, it was like 11, 12, 13 I, until I like really understood, oh, this sport is this. And that was really with anything. Right. And, uh, so yeah, it was a little bit later, but yeah. You have two sisters, obviously, as well. I know you're very close with them. What was the dynamic like all of you guys traveling around and going to these races together as kids and, and watching your dad compete? What was that like for all of you? Yeah, I mean, we were all very close. I was lucky to, um, you know, have, I, and I still do have a good relationship with my sisters. I'm the only boy and I'm the middle child. So um, <laughs> my older sister kind of shaped me and uh, I kind of shaped my younger sister. So uh, my younger sister is a spitting image of my older sister because <laughs> my older sister shaped me. So, um, yeah, I, you know, they actually, not a lot of people know this. They raced a little bit when they were growing up. Uh, they ran quarter midgets for a little while and uh, decided to step away from it kind of when it became time to take the next jump. And uh, luckily I was able to keep doing it. But, um, yeah, I mean, they were always really supportive. They still are. Um, they're my biggest fans. You know, Aaron, my younger sister's around a lot, you know, with her and William Dayton, you know, she's around a lot of the races. Um, so that's great having her around. Uh, it's a fun dynamic, you know, me and William being competitors and, <laughs> and then living together, you know, dating each other. It's, and William's a great guy. Um, so that's been neat. And then, yeah, my older sister has two boys and she lives in West Virginia. And uh, so it's great to be an uncle and, and uh, she supports me all the time. And her kids are getting old enough to, to understand racing a little bit and understand that Uncle Ryan, you know, drives the bright yellow car. So <laughs> uh, she sends me videos of them. They had a funny video when I won on Sunday. They were they were cheering. So um, it is it is cool having uh, and, and lucky to have family members who uh, are still support me. And um, yeah, they were they were fantastic. So. That's, That's cool. really cool. Now you mentioned that they used to race and I wanted to ask you this. Did you guys race against each other or who was the most competitive? Did they gang up on you at all growing up? <laughs> no, we were always in different classes. Um, okay. you know, Emma was, we're all three years apart. And so my older sister was kind of in the, the older class. And then when I started racing and then when Aaron started, um, by the time kind of, I got to Emma's class, she was out of it. You know, she stopped racing. And then when I got up there, Aaron was kind of just getting started and the, the, younger groups. So no, we never really raced with each other. Um, I would say, I mean, Emma and Aaron, they were good. I mean, they were, were super good at the nice. races and they had a lot of potential and, uh, they just didn't, they just didn't really want to do it, but, uh, they were, I remember, yeah, they were super good. And, um, it was, it was, super, it was really cool that, uh, you know, how they really enjoyed racing and they like, it was something we all had in common for that period of time. Like we all were racing a little bit, um, the same kind of cars. It was a pretty cool dynamic. Um, I don't know if we're, we weren't really like super competitive with each other. I think we were more supportive. Uh, that's just kind of awesome. We yeah. That's nice. Me and my sister were not like that. We fought all the time. <laughs> I'm not saying we didn't not fight. I mean, it was, but it was never about like racing. It was more okay. of like, did you take my shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Like, if they were ganging up on you, like you're in the middle of them and they're just beating you up because they're the girls and you're the boy. I don't know. <laughs> no, it wasn't too bad. I I was fortunate as a young kid, as a young boy, to um, I learned all the the girly movies back in the day. You know, because I, I <laughs> uh, they would always win on what movie to pick. You know, it was they would win that war, and so I got to see a lot of reference. Uh, I have a lot of references nowadays in my adult years to some you know Clueless and stuff like that. <laughs> That nice. Exactly That's good. amazing. Nice. Yeah. I wouldn't good expect stuff. anything less. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about obviously racing as a young guy, but did you identify pretty early on like, hey, I want to maybe race someday in the Cup Series? Like, was that the goal in mind or did it just kind of evolve as you went along? I, th I think it kind of it more evolved as I got older. Um, I think when I started at nine, Right, like I wanted to do what my dad did, you know, when I was growing up watching him, it's like, oh, I want to do what dad, I think, you know, kids want to be like their parents. So it's like, oh, I want to do what my dad does because I like traveling and seeing cars go fast is super cool. And um, then when I started, it was just, I didn't really have aspirations of like, I want to be a cup driver. I want to be a cup. I was just trying to do what I could do at the time. And it was just fun at that time. And I, I don't think it was, wasn't until I was probably, 15 or 16, 16, probably I realized like, Hey, I might, I might have a shot at like making a career out of this. I might be able to have this as a job and make money at it and make my living off of racing. 
Um, and, and even at that time, I never, you never know if you're going to make it to the cup level or not. You're just trying to, trying to get there. Um, but yeah, it was like kind of steps of like realization of, and then hope of like, I think I can do this. Uh, let's really pursue it. And, uh, and, you know, obviously fortunate enough that it was, uh, became a reality as I got, as I got older. Yeah. And then in NASCAR, obviously there's like some feeder series that you kind of work your way up into. So in some of those younger years, you used to race K&N West series. So I want to talk a little bit about the first win that you had, because from my understanding, you and your dad built that car and apparently kicked everybody's ass that day. So can you <laughs> just kind of tell us that experience of like working with your dad, building the car, getting to that point and then winning? Yeah. Um, yeah. And like that 2011, 2012 time, maybe it'd been 2010. Like we never did full K and N schedules. Like we, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to do that. So we just like would select races, like, and we would only select the races that NASCAR cup and like Xfinity and trucks they went to. So like Richmond's, Iowa's, Dover's, Bristol's, like we, we picked out those tracks to try to get me ready for that stuff because the shorter tracks were great, but I was, I already ran those in like super late models. So it's like, well, why do I need to go do these tracks again? Yeah. Um, let's try to get ready for the future if it's, if there is one. And, um, so yeah, we did a handful of that always ran really well. We bought an old car from, uh, it used to be Braun and then it turned to Turner. If you remember yeah. that team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we bought a car from them and, um, it was always, it was a fantastic race car. And, uh, yeah, then we, we won a West race in Phoenix. Uh, and that was, yeah, it was just me, dad. And we had uh, one or two other guys kind of helping us out every now and then setting that car up and um yeah just a, a really cool effort you know hauling your stuff all the way out to phoenix doing it yourself right going and, and competing against you know these these teams that had a lot more resources and um i mean i would have taken the hard working guys that we had the handful of them we had any day of the week just because they were super dedicated to to wanting to do this and um they were really good dudes so uh yeah that was a big one that was a, that was super cool to win i still have that trophy <laughs> It's like, <laughs> I only have four trophies in my house and that's one of them that's in that's there. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's a special memory. That's for sure. And, uh, to have dad there too, um, at that time and winning like a NASCAR sanctioned race was special. Do you guys work well together, you and your dad, or, or are there heated moments when you guys are <laughs> working on a team together? Uh, yeah, my, uh, yeah. I mean, my dad, um, everyone always saw my dad, like, and people tell me this all the time. They're like, your dad was super you know, even keel, emotionless. I was like, well, you never saw him behind closed doors then <laughs> because my, <laughs> my dad's a, uh, and I'm guilty of the same thing. I have my dad's jeans and like, you know, like light switch firecracker can like go off at any minute. Yeah. And, um, you know, dad was that way, especially, you know, teaching me the ins and outs of motorsports and racing and dedicating yourself. And, um, you know, if he thought I wasn't focused enough, you know, he'd kind of get me in line. And I, I always preferred that. I liked that way of teaching, right? Like not sugarcoating anything. My dad always mm -hmm. told me what it, the way it was. And mm -hmm. I appreciated that. I said, I appreciate it now that I'm older and I'm done with that <laughs> of getting my <laughs> ass chewed out. But, um, <laughs> you know, dad was always pretty hard on me, but always supportive. And I, I liked that way of learning and growing up. I think it helps you kind of mold yourself as a human being. Anyways, you know, fine, whatever you want to do. But I just personally like the way my dad did it. And um, nowadays, I think you realize as I've gotten older that like, we've become more friends than like, you know, and yeah. like your relationship with your parents. I think it's better as you get older because you relate yes. to them more. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, uh, he's always, he's the first guy I call even this day after every race, uh, just because that's the way I've done it for years. And, uh, but yeah, dad was uh, pretty strict growing up, but I, I preferred that. Yeah. That's awesome. I, though. I can this, relate. Yeah. <laughs> The support system is really good, of course. And I, it reminds me too of like the friendships you have within the industry. Cause you talked about like some of the, the other drivers, you guys all kind of grew up in this world together. And when you won this past weekend, Chase Elliott posted that Instagram picture of him congratulating you. And that's really cool too, because it seems like you guys genuinely really support each other and you've been going after these same goals together for a long time. What's that like? Yeah, it's definitely a unique uh, deal. You know, I'm, pretty lucky to have grown up with a lot of the guys I'm still racing with on Sundays. You know, I raced with them when I was younger, we're all around the same age. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really funny. Like you get these crops of drivers and like, yeah. it's really weird how those things happen. Uh, but yeah, 
No, I mean, gosh, me, Chase, and Bubba, I mean, we've known each other for, I've raced with those guys for 15 years at least, mm-hmm. uh, even more. You know, I raced, I started racing with Bubba when I was like nine, uh, 10 years old. So, um, and Chase the same way. Uh, so really lucky to have friendships like that. Um, you know, it's one of those things you would be friends, even if you were not in this situation, right? You're just uh, relate, relatable, um, good guys. And it's just happens that we do the same job together and uh, are competitors, but, uh, and we always support each other. You know, it's a weird dynamic. People ask me about it and, you know, we have great relationships and we respect each other a lot on the racetrack, but you want to beat your buddies like the most, right? So we're like, we, we all race each other the hardest, but you always race each other with respect, right? So it's like a, it's a cool dynamic. Um, and it's fun that we've all been able to find our own success in the sport and, um, and still remain friends outside of it. So it's funny. You talk about beating your friends the most. We're going to have a little bit of fun right here because I talked to Dylan Smith, our good buddy, Mamba hype man of NASCAR. You guys have a rock, paper, scissor competition going. Apparently you're up four one, three races <laughs> remaining, but he has a proposition for you. He said, if you and I play right now and I win, you guys reset to zero for the last three races. If I lose, then apparently I owe you 50 bones. <laughs> Are you up for that? <laughs> You owe me. I guess I don't know how I got roped into this, but he's paying me. I, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's making you pay for his. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. No, I got. No, it. you're gonna I keep it locked up. I got. I know you do because the best he can do is what tie you right now. I think. Yeah, he can. He can only tie me, and I don't. You know, the odds of that happening is just not not right. So yeah, he he. We got this rock paper scissors thing at intros. I've been just. I think I'm on like a three race win streak with him, and it's just <laughs> deteriorating his confidence, and I love it. Uh. I love it. Hey, what I had shame. to try for him. Did yeah. you know he's racing this weekend at Toledo? No, I didn't know that. Hey, breaking news. Hopefully breaking it news. comes out before this podcast comes right. out and I don't get in trouble <laughs> for saying that. But yeah. Another person who grew up racing with you guys. Okay, let's do a little rapid fire questions for a minute. Um, first things that come to your mind, okay? Uh, if an actor was going to play you in a movie, who would you want it to be? Uh, um, depends what movie, I guess. Uh like, was it comedy, a drama? Action? Say they were playing you. I mean, they were oh, playing portraying me. Ryan uh, Lane. I don't really know. Um, I have one. <laughs> I, would rather, I would more rather hear what y'all have to say. Scott that. Eastwood. Do you know who that is? Clint Eastwood's yeah, Clint son? Eastwood. I could totally see that. That's um, that's yeah. a perfect match. All you right. know, if you're Eastwood, that's acceptable to me. You know, that was awesome. So. Acceptable. Yeah. Okay. I know you're a big live music guy. You go to a lot of different concerts and stuff. What's the best concert venue you've been to, you think? Uh, by far, um, Red Rocks Amphitheater yes. in Colorado. Um, yep. That place is fantastic. Uh, was able to go there on our off week, go see somebody of ours play. So, yeah, that's that, that takes the cake out of all of them. Nice. Yeah, I've been there too. It is an incredible place. All right. Star Wars character that you most identify with. This is a hard one. Uh, yeah, stuff. I, uh, I mean, I have two Darth Vader tattoos on my legs, so <laughs> like, probably him, I gotta say. So. Darth Vader. There you yeah. go. That's, yeah. that's fair. Okay. Which brings me to the question. Do you believe in aliens? Of course. Okay. See, he was very quick on that, Heather. Quick. We've been going back and forth on this. I'm trying to convince her that they're real, and she's so sort of not on track with this. I, I do. I, I don't know. I'm, I I'm undecided. Do. I'm undecided yet. I'm not sure. She's getting there, Ryan. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on her. <laughs> I, so I heard this one thing, and this will put it into perspective for either okay. one. Oh, okay. Uh, I forget who said this, but... He said, whether aliens do exist or don't exist, they're both a very terrifying concept. Yes. That's a great way to phrase yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. No Thanks. matter either one, it's both terrifying. That's, <laughs> I think, where I, that, like, cleared it up for me, because that's kind of where I live. I'm kind of like, in the. I, I don't know. I'm a little scared if they do. I, I think that's a good one for you, Heather, but I also on the fence. How could like, they not? I don't know. Either one, does, in the middle. either one doesn't matter. If we're fully alone, that's, I think if we're fully alone, that's more terrifying than I do too. stuff out there. 1,000%. I, we were saying earlier, aliens are really having a year, though. I feel like every week on the news, I'm hearing something about aliens. All right. If you were not driving, what other career would you pick? You know, I get asked that one a lot by, like, fans oh, and stuff. bummer. And, uh, I was not original with that then. Damn it. <laughs> no, I just, it's hard to give an answer because I've only ever, like, made money doing, well, my first, I, I made a little bit of money sweeping floors. 
before I was racing. Where uh, at? Where? Yeah, where? <laughs> my dad's race shop. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It always oh, involved racing. racing. Like, so I don't know. It's been such a part of my life for literally my entire existence. Like, I don't know. I never wanted to be anything else. Um, oh. And I'm not really like that good at anything else. So I don't know. I really have no idea what to tell people when they ask me that. You were a mascot, dude. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, yeah, I need to hear more about this. Yes. You were a mascot. About <laughs> when, a mascot. where, why, for what team? You know we know Ryan, all we these aired it on Fox. The like, aliens dude. told us. The aliens told us. Yeah. You were oh. Eagle. You said it in an interview. Oh, I just saw okay. this. <laughs> yeah, yes. I was the mascot at Immaculate Heart of Mary in High Point, North Carolina. We were the Eagles, and I was the mascot for a little while. That would actually be a fun career choice. Mascots make a lot of money. It's got to be super fun to be a mascot. Like, that's like the coolest thing ever. You can, it's like going to one of those like masquerade balls. Like no one knows who you are. You can just be like hilarious and weird and just do your own thing. So a mascot, that'd be a great career choice. That'd be that's awesome. right. I was hoping you'd say it. I just teed you up for it though. Cause I, I had that prior knowledge you'd been with. Okay. You referenced your Darth Vader tattoos. How many tattoos do you have now? Cause I know a lot of your real estate's filling up. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I haven't gotten one in a few years. I kind of have a plan to knock a lot out this winter, but, uh, oh. um, one, two, three, four, five, six, I think seven or eight. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. What's, on nice. the, what's on the docket? What's coming up? Can you give us a sneak peek? Um, this is uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess the, uh, so I, I, I have a couple on my chest, but like my leg is kind of, I've been working on my leg for a while and, um, I, it's kind of stalled out, like at my knee, like I got my knee done, um, a few years back and uh, I haven't really gone any further and, um, just not really knowing what you want, you know? And so I've been, got this list compiling of, you know, these ideas and stuff to like finish it and. My guy, uh, his name's London. He's out in, in Los Angeles. So, oh, so I can yeah. go see him whenever I want. So um, I want to possibly this winter kind of go out there for a couple of days and just knock everything out. Like, let's just do this for two days and let's knock it out. Um, but I, I, I can't say what I'm getting. There's a lot of different stuff, but uh, I'm sure y'all will see it if I wear shorts at the racetrack. Yeah. It'll, it'll come up on someone's Twitter. So. Oh, yes. of course. Yep. Right. Yes. Well, that's interesting. You go all the way to LA for your tattoos. That is a commitment, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Once you find a good guy, man, you, you know, you stick with him and uh, trust him. And he's a good buddy of mine too. He's uh, and he does good job. Good job. Okay. So your grandpa raced, obviously your uncle, your dad, and they all raced on dirt. So what was your interest level of dirt racing? And I don't think you've really done it very much, right? No, not a lot. Um, you know, people ask me, uh, or they just assume that like I grew up racing dirt, uh, just because my dad and, you know, grandpa and uncle, and, um, you know, I, I have to disappoint them and be like, no, I, I really, I barely did any dirt my whole life. Um, I've ran a dirt car maybe five or six times my whole life. And, uh, it was really location where I grew up. Um, you know, I was I'm born in Ohio, but we moved down to North Carolina when I was pretty young before I started racing. And there wasn't, there's not a lot, at least back then, there wasn't a lot of dirt tracks around really. There was more of a, like asphalt quarter midgets, late models, you know, mm -hmm. asphalt late models. That was kind of the bigger thing around here. So um, that's really why I went asphalt uh, kind of starting out just because location was a little bit different than Ohio or Pennsylvania, um, like my dad did. Do you have any desire to get in a sprint car or anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I love them just because it's what my family, you know, did for so long. And um, so I, I love, I mean, I watched all the sprint car races I can. And, and I just love, you know, the sport of, of that side. And, um, but yeah, I would love to, it's just really not in the cards currently. Um, the permission slip will not get signed. <laughs> uh, we run that stuff. And it'd be, it'd be hard for me to jump in it, you know, just not doing it. I've ran a, the last time I tested a sprint car, it was like 11 years ago. So it'd be pretty tough for me to kind of go jump in it and, and kind of be up to speed. It would take me a long time to, get going just because I don't, I haven't done it in so long. And, and when I did do it, it was like two or three times. It's been very cool hearing about your upbringing, going to the track as a young man, everything you've achieved is really amazing. Um, we appreciate you doing uh, this interview today. And we usually close out every episode by asking someone what fuels you the most? What's your biggest motivation you think in your life? What fuels you? 
Um, you guys end this stuff with deep conversation. Um, <laughs> you know us, <laughs> aliens and what fuels you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know what fuels me? Aliens. Um, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know, what, what fuels me is like, I think honestly, it, it might sound cliche, uh, but really what fuels me, especially on the professional side, uh, is like making uh, all the time and money spent on me as a kid growing up racing that my mom and dad did, like trying to pay it back, like oh, show it was worth it. That's awesome. Right. So like it, essentially like making your parents proud, right? Like I want to do that for them. So that that's like the huge thing for me professionally to want to, to do. And um, yeah, you know, just seeing your parents proud, I think is like the coolest thing ever. And, uh, and luckily I've been able to do that and, and uh, continue to do it. So that's like the main motivation for me mm -hmm. in, uh, in my sport. Well, I think Great you're answer. doing a very good job of doing that. Uh, again, thanks so much for taking time for us today. Congratulations on the win. Again, we're wishing you the best of luck this weekend out at the Charlotte Roval. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate you having me. This is fun. Well, that was an awesome conversation. I loved hearing all those stories about how he grew up at the track and just all the moments he shared with his dad and winning yes. races and how they're still his biggest supporters. You can yes. tell that is a very tight knit family. Yes. It was so cool too. When he said that his sister, his older sister molded him and he molded mm -hmm. his younger sister, like how sweet, like that's, very you can sweet. tell they're very close. Like you said, mm -hmm. it, it really neat. I'm glad we had him on for our families and racing show. Cause it was perfect. Yeah, it was. And uh, again, really cool to see him get that win over the weekend. And, and now he gets to rest easy going into the Charlotte Roval and knows he's advancing on to the next round. But speaking of that, Time for our pit whip, what we're looking forward to and looking ahead to. What are what are you watching? Well, coming up this weekend is the finale for the Arkham Menard series at Toledo. So that should be a fun race. The last one, I can't believe I've done 20 ARCA races this year. That's just wild. Um, so that's, that's what I'm looking forward to this weekend. But then I'm also looking forward to, in a couple weeks, our next podcast, because I'm actually going to be in Charlotte with you I for know. that one. Woo woo. I'm so excited for that, too. That's going to be really exciting. We're going to have some big, big name guests on that show, yes. I believe. Yes. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the Roval this weekend. I always think that's such a unique event when Charlotte Motor Speedway kind of thought outside the box and wanted to do that. I think people at first were like, how's this going to go? But it's been such an entertaining race over the years. It's a home race, which is nice because everyone's here in Charlotte. So we have a couple different um, things planned that we're doing with our family and our kids uh, which will be nice change of pace because yes. Blake yes. won't be getting on a plane for once. So all around, a <laughs> lot of good things in store for the weeks ahead. Yes, I'm bummed I won't be there, but maybe yeah. next year. <laughs> but you'll be here in a few weeks. Yes. Here in the Queen City. Yes. We look forward It'll to it. It'll be fun. All right, that does it for this episode of Mics Are Hot. We'll see you next time. See you next time.